Highways are the bigger roads that people use to travel between cities, states, and even countries. You may travel on them regularly, like a commute to work, or you might experience them on an adventure to a new area. These major roadways have become so well used that American states have created a separate force just to police them, the Highway Patrol. Every day, people drive down the highway with nothing on their mind but where they're going. Sometimes, though, they never reach their destination. Highway 16 runs from the west coast of British Columbia, east out of the province. The 720-kilometer span of highway between Prince Rupert in the west and Prince George in the east is what has become known as the Highway of Tears. The two towns were connected by roads in the early 50s, but they were only gravel trails at first. Over the years, the road was widened and paved and became a major path, especially for the transport of goods across British Columbia. Despite being a major road, it cuts a path through some of the most secluded areas of the province. The highway is dotted with small towns that have no public transportation, so many people resort to hitchhiking in order to make it to essential services such as doctor's appointments and education. This causes young women to get into vehicles with strangers and drive into a vast, secluded area. In June of 2006, family members gathered in Prince Rupert, British Columbia, in preparation of walking the 720 kilometers to Prince George, calling it a cleansing walk. They were planning to be there in time for a symposium organized to discuss what to do about the unsettling number of young women who were going missing and being murdered along Highway 16. The focus of much of the symposium was on the fact that so many of the victims were First Nations women who were not getting the attention they deserved. Nothing would support that fact more than when Jack and Barbara Hoare took to the stage to speak. Their daughter, 24-year-old Nicole, was last seen hitchhiking at a gas station west of Prince George on June 21, 2002. Jack spoke about how helpful the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, or RCMP, were. He said they were immediately on top of the case and the media picked up the story. Despite never finding Nicole, the attention shined a light on the highway and the amount of young women who were disappearing or turning up dead. Before Nicole's disappearance, at least eight other young women vanished near the Highway of Tears and at least six more were discovered dead nearby. Many of these young women were from First Nation families like Tracy Clifton, Ginny Samper, Alberta Williams, Ramona Wilson, Cecilia Nicall, and her cousin, Delphine Nicall. These cases garnered little attention from the RCMP, but that would all change in 2002. On June 21, 2002, Nicole Hoare packed a backpack and headed out to hitch a ride from Prince George to Smithers. Smithers was a town on Highway 16 that was about two-thirds of the way from Prince George to Prince Rupert. Every year, the town had a festival, and since Nicole had a week off from work, she planned to meet up with her sister there. The plans weren't solid, though. Nicole was only going to meet her sister if her time off from work lined up with the festival, so when she didn't arrive, it didn't raise red flags. Six days later, when she didn't arrive back to work, which did raise red flags, her employer contacted her family and it became clear that nobody had heard from her for far too long. Nicole's employer was the one who reported her missing, and the RCMP responded immediately. Her entire family traveled to Prince George from various parts of Canada, and a local businessman let them live in two vacant houses so they could focus on the search. Police launched a ground and air search, with a search and rescue team working alongside Nicole's family and co-workers. Her employer shut down operations so all the employees could take part in the search. On July 5th, the family spoke at a press conference, begging for any information that could point them to their daughter. The media picked up the story and it was published all across the country and then into the United States. 
The RCMP said the coverage generated hundreds of tips over just a few days. Some of Barbara's friends set up a trust fund to cover expenses rising from the search. Jack's employer offered a $25,000 reward for information leading to the location of Nicole. When the search was called off, the RCMP still had 12 officers working on investigating the hundreds of tips they had received. Then Constable Mike Herchuk, the RCMP spokesperson for the Prince George area, claimed that this case didn't fit the same profile as the other women who had gone missing in the area. Those were all indigenous women who were hitchhiking at night. Oh, well Nicole was white and hitchhiking during the day. Completely different. When describing the difference between Nicole's case and past cases, one police spokesperson said, One of the main reasons is lifestyle difference. Two of the girls were known prostitutes, they weren't, but we'll get to that later, and four were native or part native. Uh, when did being native become a lifestyle choice? Now, in no way do I think Nicole should have gotten any less attention when she went missing. Anytime someone goes missing, I think every single resource should be tapped in order to find them. Someone being a drug addict, sex worker, or even a person that hitchhikes at night shouldn't make them less important than anyone else. So I applaud the intense effort that friends, family, and authorities went to to find Nicole. My question is, why wasn't that amount of effort used for women who had disappeared before? Of course, not everyone has a large family or social circle. Not everyone has friends that can set up a trust fund, but the police are the police to everyone. At least they should be. The media is an important tool that should benefit all people equally, but because they were quote-unquote just indigenous women, their stories weren't important. And though sad, it's true that the more media coverage a case gets, the more pressure the police feel to solve the case. In 2010, sociologist Kristen Gilchrist wrote a research paper that showed the difference in press coverage between missing and murdered indigenous and white women. Six cases from between 2003 and 2005 were studied. Three covered cases of missing and murdered white women, and three covered cases of missing and murdered indigenous women. Other than their ethnicity, the women's lives were similar. All attended school or had jobs. They all had close connections to family, and none had a history of running away or sex work. The white victims were mentioned in 511 articles, whereas the indigenous women were mentioned in 82. Articles about the white women's cases were longer and more likely to appear on the front page of the publication. White victims were more often referred to by name, whereas indigenous victims were far more impersonal. And why does it matter if a young woman is a prostitute or a stripper? Does that make them less deserving of being found if they go missing? Police and news outlets regularly referred to murder victims Roxanne Thiera and Alicia Germain as prostitutes, but they were both 15 years old. They were sexually exploited children. Roxanne Thiera was born in Manitoba but was placed into foster care with a woman named Mildred Thiera who lived near Prince George. Her early childhood was happy, but when she became a teen, she started acting out. She started experimenting with drugs and skipping school behavior that's not uncommon for children in foster care. A survey of indigenous youth who used drugs in Vancouver and Prince George found that two-thirds of them had been involved in the child welfare system when they were younger. When Roxanne was about 12, she was sent to a youth detention center for a petty crime. There, Roxanne befriended other girls in the facility who she remained friends with after her release. She began using cocaine and being sexually exploited by people who used her situation to their benefit. On June 27, 1994, Roxanne told Mildred that she wanted to go to treatment so she could get clean and go to school to become a fashion designer. Mildred made an appointment for Roxanne to get treatment, and Roxanne left to go retrieve her belongings, intending to return the next day. That night, Roxanne told a friend that she was going to meet a customer, and she was never seen again. Mildred spent months searching for her without the help of police. She was eventually listed as a missing person, but some newspapers report that that happened on July 5th, and others report that it happened on August 11th. Nobody really spent a lot of time on her case. Her body was found on August 17th, dumped in some bushes off of Highway 16. Her murder remains unsolved. Alicia Germain's youth was similar. She was not in the foster system, but her home life was described as tumultuous. 
She began to act out after her parents separated, again, not unusual behavior from a child. She ran away from home when she was 12 and eventually turned to drugs, which put her in a position to be sexually exploited. Like Roxanne, in 1994, she was also interested in getting clean and going back to school. She was last seen at a youth center Christmas party, but she left and disappeared. At 11 o'clock that night, her body was discovered in a wooded area near Highway 16. Though unfortunate that past victims near the Highway of Tears didn't get the publicity that Nicole Hoare did, people hoped that it would raise awareness for the tragedy that was happening along the highway. In September of 2005, a group of activists marched along Highway 16 to raise awareness about the young women who were going missing and being murdered. Four days later, 22-year-old Tamara Chipman went missing. When Tamara's father, Tom Chipman, returned home from commercial fishing, he realized that nobody had heard from his daughter in weeks. He reported her missing and said that the RCMP was very accommodating. Possibly still feeling the heat they got during the search for Nicole Hoare, they assigned multiple investigators to the case. The story was picked up in the media and a local businessman put up a website to raise awareness about Tamara and the other women who had gone missing along the highway. Volunteers working with a search and rescue team and volunteer firefighters searched for months, but she was never found. On February 2, 2006, 14-year-old Aila Sarek Agar disappeared after a day of hanging out at the mall with her siblings. The siblings had split up, so her family didn't notice that she was missing until the next day. Her mother, Audrey, tried to track her down, but when she was unsuccessful, she went to the police. It seemed that the pressure on the police had died down by the time Audrey reported her 14-year-old daughter missing, because they waved her off and told her to give it a little more time. She'd turn up eventually. They didn't put out an amber alert. They didn't even file a report. They told Audrey to come back in 78 hours. That's over three days. For a 14-year-old girl to be missing. Her body was found in a ditch along Highway 16 on February 10th, Police confirmed that the body belonged to Aila, and an autopsy found that she died from blunt force trauma to the head. This murder triggered the local community to call for a symposium to find a way to put an end to the disappearances and murders on the Highway of Tears. The first call to action was a success, and it pulled in support from all over the province. The British Columbia government, First Nations leaders, health organizations, domestic violence and sexual assault centers, and the public were all pouring in support. The police assigned 22 officers to work on Aila's murder case and an additional 15 officers to work on past cases. Florence Nazil wanted to do something to memorialize her niece, Tamara Chipman, so she decided to drive to Prince Rupert and walk all the way to Prince George. She told the newspaper and the radio station, she put out information about the walk on social media, and on March 11th, when she showed up at the starting point, she was stunned to see over a dozen people there, ready to walk with her. Not everyone walked the whole way, but a core group did about 30 kilometers a day. Over the course of a month, the group walked to Prince George and raised awareness about the symposium and the issue of missing and murdered women along Highway 16. The symposium had around 500 people in attendance. The first day was dedicated to the families of victims to tell their stories, and the second was for developing recommendations to stop the violence on the highway. The stories told on the first day were all different but similar at the same time. Matilda Wilson took to the stage to tell the story of her daughter Ramona Wilson, who went missing in June of 1994, and how she had to convince the police that her daughter was actually missing. She described the officer not being willing to even get out of his car so they began the search themselves. Eventually, when Ramona never showed up and her bank account hadn't been touched the entire time, the police finally got involved, but as far as missing persons cases go, it was way too late. The first 24 hours is the most critical, then the next 24, but if you haven't started investigating a disappearance within the first 48 hours, your chance of finding the person alive is almost nothing. So please, if the police tell you you have to wait 24 hours before reporting someone missing, don't believe them. It's not true, and the sooner the search begins, the better chances you have of finding them. The news wrote an article about Ramona's disappearance, but it wasn't published until 11 days after she had last been seen. After a few weeks, the police investigation petered out and the family was on their own again. 
In April of 1995, Ramona's body was discovered by a couple of teenagers four-wheeling. Her murder remains unsolved. This, of course, was contrasted by the overwhelming support the whores got from the police and highlighted the disparity between investigations into missing young women based on whether they were white or indigenous. During the second day of the symposium, the RCMP promised to be more receptive to all families who report someone missing. They said they would send the current cases to Vancouver to be analyzed by specialists to see if any of them match cases in other parts of Canada. They also promised to increase patrols along the highway. A shuttle bus was suggested to link the communities along the highway, which would reduce hitchhiking. Phone booths along the highway were suggested due to the poor cell phone reception in the area. Awareness and prevention programs in schools and universities were suggested, along with more health and social services in First Nations communities, so people didn't have to hitchhike to obtain basic services. It was also suggested to have a readiness plan in the event another young woman went missing. After the symposium, the RCMP began a project called ePANA. The E stands for the RCMP's BC Division, and PANA is an Inuit goddess who cares for the souls of the dead. This project was started to determine if a serial killer was operating in the area and to develop plans to investigate each case. It first focused on nine cases of missing and murder women along the Highway of Tears. Most were indigenous women. But then they added nine more cases from other areas, the victims being mostly white. Family members of the Highway of Tears victims felt that the police were diluting their efforts to help indigenous families. But the police said that if a serial killer was traveling on Highway 16, such as a long-haul trucker, it was likely that he had victims in other areas. Unfortunately, the project wasn't without flaws. Some of the cases were 30 years old and their original investigators had retired, tossing their notes at the same time. Many of the officers assigned to the project had no investigative experience. Though the project was able to put resources into the cases, they've only come up with answers to two of them. They connected the 1974 murder of 16-year-old Colleen McMillan to American serial killer Bobby Jack Fowler and convicted Gary Taylor Handlin for the 1978 murder of 12-year-old Monica Jack. The rest of the cases remain unsolved. During this time, women continued to be victims of the Highway of Tears, and it turned out that there was a serial killer, but he wasn't part of the ePANA project investigation. On November 27, 2010, a police officer noticed a pickup truck pull out of a logging road and speed down Highway 27. He pulled the truck over, and when another officer followed the tracks up the logging road, he found the body of 15-year-old Lauren Leslie. Inside the truck, they found a wrench covered in blood and a backpack which contained Lauren's ID. 20-year-old Cody Legabakov was arrested and charged with the murder, but an investigation revealed three other victims. Jill Stachenko's body was discovered in Prince George on October 13, 2009. Cynthia Moss's body was discovered in Prince George on October 10, and Natasha Montgomery went missing on August 31st, but her blood was found in Cody's apartment and he was charged with her murder despite the body never being found. Cody was convicted on all four counts and sentenced to life in prison. Since then, women continue to go missing from the Highway of Tears. Some turn up dead, others are never found. The majority of the women are indigenous. Indigenous women make up about 4% of the total female population of Canada, but account for 16% of all female homicides. Police still treat indigenous women as less important, so they often quickly rule their deaths as suicides, drug overdoses, or accidents. They classify the women as high risk, but many of them have no choice but to live the lifestyle they do. In the late 19th century, Indigenous children were forcibly removed from their homes and sent to live at boarding schools that attempted to suppress their heritage. The colonial settlers wanted to assimilate the natives to be more European. At the residential schools, the students suffered physical and sexual abuse, malnutrition, lack of medical care, poor sanitation, and corporal punishment. Schools were intentionally placed far away from the reservations to make visitation by parents more difficult. The students were also included in a number of experiments without their knowledge, including malnutrition experiments, vaccine trials, and studies on extrasensory perception. 
The schools began closing in the 1960s, but they left a lasting effect on the indigenous population. The trauma from the schools led to increased alcoholism and poverty. These traumas have gone on to affect generations following the people who attended the schools. So despite authorities' attempts to provide equal support to indigenous families of missing persons, the issue is a generations-old, systematic problem that isn't just going to go away. It will likely take generations to eliminate the social stigma surrounding the indigenous communities. On July 3, 2016, the Canadian government announced a national inquiry into missing and murdered indigenous women. It was immediately plagued with problems. The victims' families were expected to contact the commission instead of the commission reaching out to them. That included a hotline to call where families would leave a message and never hear back. Some family members were able to schedule meetings and hearings, but they were cancelled at the last minute. It was a complete bust. In September of 2017, two commissioners from the National Inquiry were set to preside over hearings in the town of Smithers, right on Highway 16. More than 10 years after their first cleansing walk in 2006, dozens of family members gathered in Prince Rupert to walk the 350 kilometers to Smithers in time for the hearings. There, families spoke about the loved ones who were no longer with them, the ones who vanished and were never seen again, the ones who were found but were still gone, explaining that, in a world where their families were often overlooked, they just wanted their loved ones to matter. Women continue to disappear along the Highway of Tears. Less than a month after the hearings, Frances Brown disappeared while she was out picking mushrooms near Smithers. Her disappearance remains unsolved. Chantel Simpson's body was found in a river on July 22, 2018. Her death remains unsolved. Jessica Patrick's body was found on a road near Smithers on September 15, 2018. Her death remains unsolved. Cynthia Martin was last seen on December 23, 2018. Her disappearance remains unsolved. Lorene Fabian was last seen on October 28, 2019, near her home in Houston. Her disappearance remains unsolved. Unfortunately, this list will continue to grow. When you're walking down the highway, especially one specific highway in British Columbia, look around and remember all of the people who used it, but never reached their destination. And make sure you stay safe. Thanks for letting us tell you this sinister story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on and hit like, rate it, or leave a comment. Join us next week when we'll take you somewhere sinister.